after I finish about this. Okay, we're going to talk about some little troubleshooting surprises here. I've, I've used this picture here for a while because I think it's really cool. That's a bunch of the old equipment that you know used to be used a long time ago back in the day. You know, that's back in the 1950s there and all that. Well, I drove a, a this Taurus, it only had about 50,000 miles on it at the time. And I started to notice this little misfire under load when I was trying to throttle about 45. Um, somebody was talking about having a, a similar skip like that. You're in, you're in overdrive, you're in your highest gear, you're crowding the throttle a little bit, and it's got a bite. Boom, 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 boom. Recently, we, I mean, somebody in here was talking about having that. I can't remember who it was. One of us, but we're working on one here. Well, that's you. Yeah, you were talking about that, I think. Yeah. But anyway, the long and the short of it was uh, whenever it's at the heaviest load is whenever you're going, you know, you're biting like that. If it's biting like that at a real heavy load, then that's, a, that's an ignition misfire. And it typically means it's leaking spark. Spark plugs cracked, the spark plug wire is bad, or there's something else, something else like that going on or a bad call pack into that too. All right, so uh, I picked up some motorcraft platinum spark plug, gapped a little bit wider than spec. I like to do it that way because it tends to idle better when you do it like that. Some of the old vans used to say 42 to 46. If you put it on 42, uh, they'd set their idling going boom, boom, boom. You know, if you hear the spark, if you hear a random misfire at idle, that typically means that they didn't get the plugs or one of them slightly fouled or something like that. Uh, well, I was uh, pulled the codes, found the DTC wasn't a misfire code, it was a code for the number one coil primary. All right, the primary is where the little wires go into the coil to trigger the fire. The secondary is where the big wires come out and make the spark. Okay? Even on a relay, if you're talking about primary and secondary, primary is what triggers relay, secondary is where the work's getting done. You got that? I understand that. These coil packs usually did develop a dead tower rather than causing a misfire under load. That didn't mean the coil pack was bad. When the spark plug was placed, the misfire was about 85% better. Went out through a coil pack. Limit. And uh, I said, you know, I think I'll buy a motor trap coil pack, you know, because I don't know if I wanted one of these other brands that was made in China. So when I bought that one there, it said made in China. Okay, so go figure. <laughs> All right, I was really happy about that. Well, the run of the mail diagnosis number two was a little bit tougher. 2001 Jeep Cherokee is when I was driving a yellow one. It would skip to beat the band for about 60 seconds after a 30 minute summer drive and a 20 minute hot show. What that means is I would drive from here to Win Dixie, pull in to get some bananas or something, walk in there, come back out, get in, I crank it up, and, going, bup, 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 and it would flash the check engine light because of a misfire code, then it would clear up, then it wouldn't skip anymore until the next time I drove it along where it parked it hot. Right. Whenever you talk about a hot soak, that means you park this thing, there's no coolant circulating, there's no nothing, it's just sitting there and for a little while it gets a little hotter if you if you do it on a graph and then it cools off over the down. Alright, it consistently calls the BO303 code and from time to time coolant had to be added. What that means is, even though I don't see any coolant on the ground, it's going out past the head gasket. That's typically what that means. Uh, if you don't have a leak, it's not showing up in the wall, it's not showing up on the ground, but you keep having to add coolant, it's going in the going out the tailpipe. That's bad news, but that's just what it is. You, uh, there wasn't any pressure building in the coolant system and it wasn't overheating. This is one of the ways the head gets get to blow. These four liter Cherokee engines, like the one in that red one out there, like to crack the engine, blow gaskets in the number three cylinder area. All right. So I usually do this. Whenever there were, I've got one that's doing that, and I've, talk, I've said this a zillion times in these classes in here, crank it up, while it's still skipping, you shut it off and you pull all the plugs out and see what they look like. If you pull all the plugs out and one of them is steaming water, you know that one. Or if one of them looks rusty, you know, like it's got a lot of rust on it, I'm talking about the plug itself is kind of rusting away in flakes, that typically means it's actually pushing uh, coolant into that cylinder. And that's what was going on with that one there. If the spark plug is sooty when you do that, that means you got a dripping injector. Now typically if you got a dripping injector, it'll be a hard start hot. It'll spin and spin and spin and spin and it'll fire up. First time I saw that was on a uh, 87 Thunderbird. <coughs> It wasn't very old, and typically those Thunderbirds, when you go to start them, they should fire right up. That one would spin for about 30 or 45 seconds before it started up, and whenever I finally figured out what was wrong with that one, it had three dirty, three injectors that were dripping. When you pull the injectors out, you know, the tips of the injectors usually look kind of dirty and grungy. If you see some that are clean, that means they're leaking, because they're keeping their stuff washed off. Okay, just remember that. All right. In this case, and this is an actual photo of that Jeep, it turned out that the number three cylinder was receiving a little dose of unwelcome coolant when it was shut down hot. See where it was leaking in there? All right. And it would misfire, on, it wet the plug, misfire, 
Because whenever a plug is wet, the spark runs on the wet instead of jumping the gap. And it don't fire the cylinder, right? Head gasket will seep and cool it past the fire ring. The fire ring is at part around the outside of the cylinder. And the number four, had the head check for cracks, valve job, and put in new gaskets and juices, and it was smooth. That's a little closer look at that. Now, you know what you're looking at? If you ever got any idea when you pull a head off, you're not sure if, by, from just looking at it, you know, you, you may not jump out and grab you like that. Sometimes when you look at it, you may not see it. But if you start shining a really bright light across it, so that it'll make everything stand out in more relief. You know what I mean? You ever shine a light across something like some numbers on the tire or something to get a better look at it? Shine a light across there, you'll see a place usually where the gasket's blown that way. There's a bunch of ways gasket can build them. Blow between cylinders, they can blow, we let the compression into the coolant. They can let coolant into the cylinder without it going the other way. Uh, they can leak oil or just all kinds, of, they can leak coolant to the outside, a bunch of different ways. <laughs> so when somebody talks about a blown fuel cell, these pictures over here. See, they're talking about that on that head gasket thing. Uh, these are easy to figure out. Then there's these bait and switch problems that make it look like we're incompetent. Right? And so those are the ones who bother us the most. Well, Terry, this guy who worked here at the college for a while, he called me one day, told me his 2007 CRV had lost his scouting tool. And it wasn't the air conditioning that wasn't working. It's an air conditioner thing too, see? <coughs> and he's driving with the windows down on a little rainy summer day. That sort of stinks, right? So we get with the compressor while it's spinning. What we do, turn on the AC, compressor spinning. If it's not spinning, why is it not spinning? Was it low on the refrigerant? Well, we identified the charge, connected the Big Mac refrigerant machine, we noted about 100 PSI on both gauges. Does that mean it's got enough refrigerant? Well, it ought to kick the compressor on even if it's on a short cycle. Well, we concluded that compressor's inactivity wasn't related to charge pressure, so it was time to poke them on the wire. All right, so most many of the relays are only identified on the cover with an open book and a big I symbol, but there are two of the relays that identified with snowflake. One had a graphic of a fan and a snowflake, so our focus shifted to the lone snowflake. Yeah. All right, you see, whenever you flip that cover over, don't you just love this right here? They don't tell you what these relays do. They just got a, a book with an eye. Ain't that ridiculous? If they're going to put stuff on the other side of the panel, why in the same way won't they tell us what's there? Some of them tell you, some of them don't. Okay, so this is going to be our compression relay. So now what are we going to do? All right. So we've got to put, we put a finger on the relay. What we want to know is, do we hear it click? All right, when we turn on the air conditioner, do we feel the relay click? Now, if the relay clicks, does it mean the relay is good? All it means is that the coil is able to close the contact, but it doesn't mean the contacts are able to carry any current, right? All right, so with the PCM relay removed, the trigger signal applied from the PCM or switch, each relay should have two powers and two grounds. If that circuit is energized so that it ought to be running, you should have two powers and two grounds in that relay. This is basically on the most basic relay circuit. One power is for the coil, the other power feeds relay for the B+. Plus. Some of that, sometimes those will both come from the same plate. But when the load's carried, it's going to go out through the relay to, you know, on the wire by itself. This one has two powers and only one ground. We have a missing ground. Okay, so where's the two powers? Two powers come from, obviously, B plus. Where do two grounds come from? One's a relay call. One's turning on the relay call. The other one is a ground that's coming back through the load. Got it? So in other words, if you've got an AC compressor coil that's grounded down there, I'm talking about it's got a ground wire on the other side of it, and that wire is coming all the way through this relay, if I hook my test light to power, I ought to be ground there because my test light is actually going to not pull enough current to click that relay on because the relay is even going to pull more. All right, so this is what we did right here. All right, we took the relay out, took the test light out. Got it? it should light up because of that ground. But what we had down here is an open circuit, the compressor clutch. No ground there, we checked the resistance of the compressor clutch ball, it had a difficult access without the moving unit. We found it wide open. If I've got a burned out compressor clutch ball or one that's open like that, now you obviously need to check these connectors because occasionally somebody's got down there working on it, they took their test light and they've rammed it into the connector and spread it out so it doesn't make a good connection. That's a bad idea. And, you know, a tapered test light works really good for destroying the connector so that it won't make contact. Okay, so we've got an open circuit there. All right, we priced out in order to compression. Let's just go ahead and put a compression on it, you know. Doesn't usually cost all that much more. Usually you'll pay 
sometimes you'll pay 110, 115 dollars for this, and you'll pay 125 or 150 for that if you know where to buy it. You know, um, of course, usually if uh, some of the <laughs> this one lady took her Nissan uh, uh, Altima to a shop over here, and they shined a flashlight down there and looked at it and checked a couple of fuses. And said, we don't know what's wrong with it. We think it will cost a thousand dollars. You know, bunch of other stuff like that. All right, so uh, if the coil winding is tested good, we'd be looking at a wire harness for ground concern. Now, you know what a bait and switch thing? I put a call to Rand Shoe, worked up the numbers, gave Terry a call. He's really happy. He said, hey, let's go ahead and do it. So he picked it up that afternoon. He was going to drive it. So we got it in. So I got a call. Yeah. Well, actually, Rand Shoe had put, we got the compressor put it on there before this next slide happened. So it, the, everything was fine. But I, caught, I got a call from Terry, and he says, his starter wouldn't operate, but everything else was normal. He didn't have no starter operation. Did we do this? Did we cause this problem? Let's see. He's 15 miles away. I didn't have any idea why he was having a problem, so he decided to have a shop plane. He called back and said the shop plane that we hadn't plugged the starter relay back in properly. Now we were working in the fuse box under the hood, right? Look where the starter relay is. Mm. Starter relay is under the dash. We didn't even go under the dash. We ain't done nothing under the dash. But the starter relay died. Really? All right. Starter relay is not even under the panel. The relay is located way down here, right in that passenger panel. All right. About the time the Honda's compressor was ordered, we got a call about a 2008 Nissan Maxima with a lot of codes and an inoperative dash panel, including AC function. That one has suffered the piggy bank syndrome. You'll see what it is. Uh, which is a common problem nowadays that just about every busy Nissan service and shop has seen. Uh, I'll show you what it means. This looks like a dandy place to throw coins, doesn't it? What happens is they fall down between that screen and right there. Ain't that brilliant? Well, look where they go. See that little slot in that box? This is a unified meter and AC amplifier. Coin size slot in it. And it's a little expensive box with an imported circuit board that does all kinds of metal money, ruins electronics, and shorts out cigarette lighter sockets. You got it? So whenever we took that thing out of there, we actually found a penny in there. See, it destroyed it. See where it burned up the circuit and all that kind of stuff? Probably repair. It didn't cost a penny to generate, but it cost a lot to fix. All right. This was a 2003 Mazda V2300 that ordinarily ran like a dream. It belongs to one of our maintenance men, and he pulled around the automotive with a perplexingly rough idle that had happened all of a sudden. Okay. Vacuum leak, common to all the cylinders, usually raises the idle, one of them can skew his fuel trims. Well, a leak on just one intake runner can kill a single cylinder, or maybe two, and the fuel trim will drive to the plus side of zero, but it's going to add fuel to make up for that lean. This one actually kind of like that, a little bit faster idle, but really rough, and it happened all at once. All right, we did the smoke. We capped off the throttle body. We pumped smoke in through the uh, brake booster hose, and we saw all this smoke coming from down this area right here. I mean, a lot of smoke. It wasn't just a little bit of smoke. It was a lot of smoke. All that. So that little thing right there had popped out of that hole. There's a little plug. Popped out of the hole and laid right down there. And so... Uh, a little bit of plastic well took care of that problem. Now most places will go ahead and replace the uh, manifold for one of these. But if you've got the plug, why not put it back where it goes with some plastic weld or something, right? No problem with that. All right, so the compressor arrived. We identified the refrigerator again, pumped it out, heat the engine compartment with the engine running because it was cooled in. And the old compressor was removed and we checked the clutch coil which was just totally open. So we lay the compressor on a bench, we put power and ground to the clutch coil to see if it's gonna fire up, and it won't, won't close. We take the new compressor, we lay it up there, we put power and ground to the clutch coil, it goes click, click, click. We verified the compressor clutch coil and not a wiring problem with our issue, right? All right, so, verified the bad coil, come in with oil in it, we went ahead and replaced the desiccant bag, pulled the system down, 15 minutes, check the vacuum for vacuum loss, put everything back together, we knew the old compressor had an open clutch, we knew the compressor's clutch was good, the compressor still wouldn't engage after we put it on there. Makes us look like we don't know what we're doing, don't it? It turned out the AC clutch relay was faulty, but back it up, we not only found out you are really, really, really late. What we did was we found out that the that there was a ground coming through the compressor clutch fault, right? 
and we also found out that whenever we pull the old compressor off, that it would energize. It would energize. So we know the compressor clutch all was bad. We had no qualms about that. But when it came back, was this relay bad before? Who knows? We heard it click, but we didn't actually check the relay. You got me? That makes sense? All right. When did it burn out? Did somebody at the shop in town pull the starter relay from under the dash and put it in the AC relay slot? I don't know. Remember they said, did the AC relay fail before or after the compressor plate burned out? We may never do. All we had to do to get his AC up and running, plug that thing in there. Let's see. <clears throat> now, we'll tell you this. Sometimes when it comes back and you worked on it, it may be something you did. So it's best to give the customer the benefit of the doubt. One of the clearest examples of that that I was uh, thinking of was the uh, the customer comes back after we pull the transmission and replace the seal, rear main seal on his uh, little S10 blazer, and we put it all back together, and um, everything was fine except he came back and he says, my, my hatch release won't work anymore. You know, when you push the button and the hatch goes boom, and pops loose, and I said, okay, heck do we have to do with that? You know, but uh, we'll have a look at it. We'll see what we can do about it. You know, and you know, there ain't no use of getting all cockeyed and saying, oh, you know. So we pull it in here, and I started looking at the wiring schematic, and I noticed that the pull it off the ground the shape of that. Well, I noticed that the doggone uh, neutral safety switch provides a ground to the hatch, because if it's not in park or neutral, that thing won't work. Because you don't want to actually hit that button going down the road. You lose ice chest, dogs, kids, all kinds of stuff that way. So what I mean is, you know, so basically if it's driving down the road, you don't want the hatch working. So I got under the truck and I looked and that guy had plugged that safety neutral switch back in. You know, it's gummy stuff that's around them Chevy neutral switch connectors and painted. Plugged the thing back in and he got it plugged in where everything else will work, but it wasn't getting the ground of that thing. So it was something we did, even though it didn't seem like it. Another case of that crap. Uh, my sister drove a 77 Caprice that she had for a while, she's a junkie old green car. And she said something about my dad about putting uh, uh, brakes on it. So he puts brakes on it and he backs it out, and, you know, brake pads, backs it out, puts it out there. She comes to pick it up, radio don't work. <laughs> so she starts pulling all the fuses and everything, finds radio fuse blown. So she stops at the park store and she goes in there and she puts a fuse in there and she plugged it in, turned it on, and he bah, pop the fuse again. So she went in there and she got another fuse and plugged it in and turned it on, pop. And the guy in the park said, says, look, why don't you figure out why it's blowing the fuse or you'll just feel pretty silly changing 10 or 12 fuses and watching them blow one at a time. And so anyway, so her and my brother started giving my dad a hard time because he messed up our radio when he put brakes on it. Really? But it was working when he pulled it into the shop and now when she backed it out, it wasn't working. And so I said, if y'all would shut up and leave daddy alone, I'll figure this out, you know. So I took the radio out of the car and held it out here where it wasn't touching anything and unplugged the antenna wire where we get around that way and the fuse didn't blow until I touched the radio to the metal part of the deck. And so I took the top off the radio and right inside the radio there was a big old capacitor in there. It looked like a condenser out of a distributor and that sucker was shorted. He didn't do that. What I did was I went snip, I cut the wire going to that capacitor and it didn't blow the fuse anymore. Yay! So I got another capacitor to put in there and they were good to go. Did he cause that? No, but the radio was working when he pulled it into the shop, but it wasn't working when he backed it out. You know what I mean? My brother had his tires rotated one time. And he wound up with radio static. And he was telling me, well he didn't put this together. He didn't put it together. He just said he didn't. He didn't say they did this when they rotated my tires. But I was in there checking grounds and antenna lead and all this kind of junk in there and, and whatnot. And it turned out that he had spoke wheels on that one, and one of the spokes was bent or something. So he could identify. He goes, "Wait a minute. This was back in the days when you weren't supposed to cross rotate radial tires because they might come apart." He said, "They put my radial tires on here. They cross rotated them, and I told them not to do that." And so he put the tires back on the other way they were supposed to go, and all of the radio static went away. Because those steel belts were making, you know, radio frequency interference and all that. So, That's yeah. weird. Yeah. Well, see, you can, you can come up with there's all kinds of stuff like this, and I remember, you know, uh, this one guy bought his truck. Uh, his, uh, he was a vending truck driver, vending machine truck driver, and he says, uh, uh, 
my truck won't start. And I said, okay, so I go out there and I check the spark and it'll only jump about a quarter of an inch and that's not enough. I don't care what your textbook says. It needs to be able to jump an inch and just scare the crap out of you. And he's, I mean, I'm talking about chain blue lightning. And it would barely jump. And he just happened to be standing there, the guy that drove the truck, and I said, uh, yeah, you need a coil. That's what we're going from here. And so I was putting a coil on it, you know, and we fired it up. And he says, well, I ran this thing out of gas yesterday. Could that have caused that? Not, well, I don't think so. I said, but what you run into is what we run into all the time here. We do something, something else breaks, now they're wanting us to fix that, you know. Mm -hmm. There was another time when this guy brought his truck in here. It was an older model uh, F-150 that back when they had a lift pump in the gas tank and one on the frame, like an 86 model or 87 or something, and it was cutting up and not running right. And he hadn't opened the hood on that truck since it was who knows when. And the throttle body was filthy, the idle air control was just about burned out. It, I mean, it was just a bunch of stuff wrong with it. The throttle position sensor was, you know, scratchy and all that. So I fixed all of that stuff, did all the maintenance stuff he should have done, and got it running real smooth. And then he drove it uh, away, and then he came back a day later, and he said, hey, I'm still having trouble. And I said, uh, so I checked it, and you could, inside the gas tank, if you unplug the pump on the frame and listen to the gas tank, you could hear that little pump inside the tank humming if it was working. And the pump inside the tank would work sometimes and sometimes it wouldn't. And if that one inside the tank ain't working, it won't feed the one on the frame on those trucks. And it'll cause it to run sometimes and sometimes it won't. And that was what his problem was. And I said, you need that pump inside the tank and it's going to cost like $250 to pull that tank off and change that pump and all that kind of stuff. He said, well, is that going to fix my truck? I said, yeah, you'll never need another oil change as long as you own the truck. You never have to come back to shop again for nothing else. He said, oh, come on, man. I said, well, I can't tell you. I mean, all I know is, I know what's wrong now. I know what I fixed before, you know, all this maintenance stuff that had to be done. You know, you got to fix the foundation before you can go up to the house, right? That's basically what's going to be doing that. That's the end of the slideshow. What did you learn? You have some funny stories. Here's the deal. Here's the old funny stories. Ha, 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 ha. Very good. <laughs> uh, what we got here, let's say we got a, uh, we're going to, let's say that we take our, our Nissan, like I was talking about. How did we determine what was wrong with the Nissan that she came in here that they said we don't know what would be wrong with think it might be a thousand dollar? Yeah, this is another one, a different Nissan. This oh. is the Nissan Altima 2010 model. We took a test lap, we hooked it to power, and we go to the wire that's going down to the, you know, you can go to the relay sometimes, but if you see the wire going out of the compressor, you know, you can seal the wire up with that sort of clear fingernail polish crap, you know, if you want to do that. So anyway, I'm going to take a good, with it hot, nothing turned on, hot battery terminal, I go into that wire going down to that compressor, what should I see? You see a ground power. With a ground. I should see a ground. Okay, I leave the test light there, go into that wire, and then I move it to the ground side, and I tell them to crank it up and turn on the compressor. When they crank it up and turn it on, the light lights up. So I've got power going down there, but i got no ground coming back. The coil on the compressor is open. We know, we know right then what's wrong. See, that, that's the best kind of troubleshooting you can do is when you've got a quick test where you can tell. You saw us this, this happened the other day on that Dodge truck. Of course, you know, uh, when he, he got on here and he says, uh, I, it's funny to see the look on his face. You know, you see Charles when a light bulb comes on. He goes, <laughs> you know, like he's got stuff. <laughs> but anyway, I says, okay, let, show me the fuel pump really. He goes, right there. And I said, pull it out of there. Positive battery terminal. I don't see a ground there. I said, Jennifer. Get in there and hit that gas tank with a rubber mallet. Boom, light comes on. I said, see, that's a bad fuel pump. We knew that in, what, 15, 20 seconds? I mean, that quick. We knew what was wrong with that truck. And then we put a fuel pump in there. And then, of course, he went and got it from some parts house over there. And you remember when we, remember when we, when we snapped that float in there? You know, you had to snap the float in. You had to take it and flap it in there. And I said, all right, that's how the float works. Up and down. You see that? You remember me doing that? So I put it in there. Well, the guy called back. He said, my gas gauge ain't working. You almost put that float arm on upside down. Really? I mean, there ain't no way you can put it on upside down. It's been possible to do that, the way that thing's made. I mean, there's only one way that you can put it on there. If you try to put it on backwards, it ain't gonna stay. It's gonna fall out. And we put it on. And I said, held it up for y'all to see. I held it up. I said, see? You know, so maybe O'Reilly's needs to come up with him a different pump. I don't know. But the long and short of it is. That's one of them things, you know, where they say, hey, y'all did something wrong, you know. Well, we got him going so he can at least drive his truck, you know. Always blame the mechanic. Yeah, we'll see about that. I always blame, or I always blame the black box if you are the mechanic, you know. That's how that works. You know, the black box is a thing you don't understand. This was what was funny to me. The other day, Charles said, I want me one of these. <laughs> and I says, Charles, 
If it doesn't have that big old 12 volt power supply connected to it, it ain't gonna have no power. You can have one of these all day long, but there's nothing in it. <laughs> Did you spot? I thought it was like 120 to 12 volts. <laughs> no. No, I wasn't 120. I mean, I can show you how to build one like that if you want to. It ain't hard. But uh, anyway. All right.